Quote, Since I have come to know the body better, Zarathustra said to one of his disciples, the spirit is, to me, only quasi-spirit, and all that is permanent is also a mere parable. I have heard you say that once before, the disciple replied, and at that time you added, but the poets lie too much. Why did you say that the poets lie too much? Why, said Zarathustra, you ask why? I am not one of those whom one may ask about their why. Is my experience but of yesterday? It was long ago that I experienced the reasons for my opinions. Would I not have to be a barrel of memory if I wanted to carry my reasons around with me? It is already too much for me to remember my own opinions, and many a bird flies away. And now and then, I also find a stray in my dovecot that is strange to me and trembles when I place my hand on it. But what was it that Zarathustra once said to you? That the poets lie too much. But Zarathustra too is a poet. Do you now believe that he spoke truth here? Why do you believe that? The disciple answered, I believe in Zarathustra. But Zarathustra shook his head and smiled. Faith does not make me blessed, he said, especially not faith in me. End quote. That's from Zarathustra Part 2, Chapter 12, on poets. And uh, while it's ostensibly about poets and their trustworthiness, I think the the scene contains so much, uh, so many gems for helping us to sum up the central thrust of Nietzsche's affirmative philosophy, his spiritual philosophy, as I have called it, which is anti-spirit. And we'll talk briefly about what that means. Uh, the idea of Geist in German, which contains both the concept of mind and spirit, or means something approximate to both, um, that had been invoked in both a philosophical and religious context. And in spirit, we have something which is a conception of the immaterial. Spirit is not subject to the laws of physics. It doesn't arise and pass away like matter. It's not something destructible. From the time of the ancient Greeks, philosophers and priests alike have made reference to an indestructible being, either a primordial unity from which we steal our existence, as in the concept of the indefinite, the aperon, uh, written of by Anaximander, or else the Vedantist view that all the world is of the same substance as the Brahman, the Godhead, and that this entire reality occurs behind a veil of Maya, which means uh, illusion, and that therefore there exists, in fact, only the one, and our separateness from it is simply our own ignorance, our own delusion. And we can recognize the same thought about being throughout the history of both Eastern and Western philosophy. Since nothing seems to last in physical reality, then why not take the Buddhist view at the end of the day that all phenomenon we perceive in physical reality are basically empty? And that to the extent that anything exists, it only exists at best as a representation. It's only within our perception that definite boundaries or a sense of duration can exist. Now, in the West, in contrast to that Buddhist view, we have not been content to rest at that position that things are all empty and impermanent. We've, we've instead sought for that permanent, indestructible being. And since the advent of Christendom, or even of monotheism generally, this has always been associated with God, this uh, permanence of being. And within ourselves, we project the same concept of being. Our identity is secured in Christian thought because we have an immortal soul, uh, which is created in the image of that same permanent, indestructible being. And remember, God is a spirit in Christianity. Um, our souls are also spiritual and not material. And so the, we've created this whole spiritual realm in which there is permanence, in which there can be permanence. The physical form, the body, does not have the same degree of reality as spirit within the this type of worldview because the body is impermanent. Uh, we've made permanence in this uh, view the standard of being. And therefore, we now say spirit alone is and thus, at the end of Goethe's Faust, in the final 
lines of the play, the chorus Mysticus sings as Faust ascends to heaven, quote, what is destructible is but a parable, what fails ineluctably, the undeclarable, end quote. Which means um, all that has happened in the past no longer exists. Only what's happening in the present is real. All that exists within this world of arising and passing away, therefore, is at best only a parable. Because what's real is eternal. What has permanence is what has true substance. Um, and so we might say you can kind of look at the whole story of all these destructible things, this narrative of, uh, you know, whatever it might be, the classic hero cycle or the story of your own life, right? But in the end, that story is the only thing that's real. Um, it's a very deep set of lines that has contextual meaning specific to the Faust play. Uh, and so far as the chorus is announcing that all the things that were said and done in the course of Faust's story form a parable. Um, but in, in that, in some sense, that's uh, those stories very clever way of, um, of saying what can't be said that all is fleeting. And yet the story of all is permanent that the archetype, the ideal, uh, exists uh, timelessly. Um, and so the story of our lives, you know, it, it isn't written until the end when it becomes history. That's when it attains meaning. Just as Faust's story can't really be understood until it is enclosed by the conclusion. And, um, you know, the undertone of all this, it's clear in the context of the story because it takes place against the backdrop of Faust being reborn into his new immortal perfect body into eternity faust becomes being in the story and uh so as the, in the chorus indicates this is a mystery it can't fully be um encapsulated into words that's why we have the story right the meaning is illustrated in the parable where it was translated into action rather than words um and so it's a very uh, it's a very deep and beautiful uh idea but the fatal flaw as we've discussed it uh, literally the fatal flaw as we've discussed it throughout the podcast, is that by the time that definite ending happens in our own lives, our lives are over. It's uh, another way of restating Nietzsche's criticism of the world of spirit, that insofar as it is a means of justifying life and making it bearable, it promises redemption only in death. And so Zarathustra directly in these lines uh, rebukes the chorus mysticus at the, beginning of, at the beginning of the passage. And he says, on the contrary, that what is permanent is but a parable. That rather these assertions of something which transcend the conditions of impermanence and temporality that we see in the physical world only exist in our minds. Uh, mere abstractions, spirit is only quasi-spirit. What he means by that remark uh, true enough, Geist means mind, and that spirit surely exists within this world of the mind, but as such an abstraction, right? Uh, it's uh, nominally real, but it's not physically real. And so that's the real essence of our being is physical, physiological, and that it, therefore, our being is subject to temporality and impermanence. Um, and then rather than believing in these um, parables of God or Brahman, in order to imagine that we can have something by which to anchor ourselves and our existence. Instead, Zarathustra says he's come to understand the body better. We have to come to understand ourselves as bodies. That life is necessarily embodied. It's physical. And, um, you know, because it's necessarily embodied, it's individual and subjective. It comes with this certain perspective, right? Um, and by imagining on the other side of that coin that the root of life and its foundation is found in something spiritual, you know, uh, meaning abstract, permanent, absolute, that's what we mean by spiritual, uh, by doing that, we've harmed life. We've frozen it. Um, I have a close friend who he's got sort of a, oh, he, he describes him as a weird family member who, uh. He says his hobby is to freeze and photograph uh, wasps. I was like, what? Apparently you can sort of like uh, freeze them. I don't know what they use, but it like slows them down. And then you can basically take them and photograph them. 
but uh, you know, it's like, that's, uh, that's what I think that's a great mental image for what Nietzsche might uh, criticize all of our metaphysics of spirit and what it does to our conception of life. Um, and so Zarathustra, further down in the passage, uh, he says, quote, All gods are poets' parables, poets' prevarications. Verily, it always lifts us higher, specifically to the realm of the clouds. Upon these, we place our motley bastards and call them gods and overmen, end quote. So, it, he's, it's funny because, so he's, we're talking about the realm of the clouds, uh, the obvious philosophical referent you would think would be like cloud cuckoo land. Um, there are very ob- obvious implications about your head being in the clouds. And what Zarathustra employs to talk about, um, or rather to uh, invert the way we think about the realm of spirit in relation to the physical, as spirit giving rise to the physical, or at least the way people tended to think about it in his own time, um, of thinking instead uh, implicitly in that quote I just read of the physical being the thing that gives rise to the spiritual, that the abstract, the conceptual life has a physiological origin. And he employs not only the idea of God, he also uses his own idea of the overman, or he's, you know, we call them gods and overmen. It's not obviously Nietzsche's own idea of the overman, but um, he's established the concept of the overman throughout the text as his, you know, new uh, ideal for mankind uh, that is beyond Christianity, that is uh, in line with the sort of Dionysian view of humanity and what life is. And, but here he recognizes um, all these ideals are stories and fibs. And in all ideals, what actually happens is that those of us here and now who are, depending on what terms you want to use and how religious your own interpretations of human action are, uh, might be, you know, we're all variously unholy and wayward and lustful and murderous and vindictive, you know, all these things you could say about the human race. And then we're the ones who come up with the image of what holiness looks like. You know, us modern day people who are um, imperfect and selfish and with our cobbled together cosmopolitan moralities and religious beliefs. Um, And then we presume to say what the overman would look like. Uh, when we do that, we inevitably construct such an image out of our own values and our own virtues or lack thereof. And so how will those of us who are sick and have always been sick produce an image of what is healthy? Now, going back to earlier in the dialogue, um, the response from the disciple when he hears Zarathustra say that permanence is but a par- parable, so he remembers Zarathustra saying this before, but before he remembers Zarathustra included, but the poets lie too much, as a sort of caveat. But Zarathustra's answer to this is to clarify that he's also a poet, and that he can't therefore be trusted in saying that the poets lie too much. Um, and the reason why he would say poets lie too much um, you know, so it's funny because that's sort of a, uh, it's a self-referential, self-destroying statement, right? But throughout Nietzsche's work, um, what he has to say about artists uh, or the artistic pr- process, um, he says there's an essential incompleteness to art and an essential will to deception that exists in art. Um and many authors throughout the years have levied charges like this. But uh, Nietzsche, on the other hand, includes himself in the lot of the uh, accused. <laughs> and, and he struggles over it uh, sometimes, especially in his poetry. And so when Zarathustra says the poets lie too much, he also inc- must include himself amongst the poets. And... So what is the caveat to Zarathustra's refutation of impermanence here and his rebuttal to Goethe? Why does Zarathustra take care to remind us that he lies too much when he, when he gives us this rebuttal? And perhaps it is because this view of life that Zarathustra presents is also a poetic gloss on reality. That would be a surface level reading uh, that life as becoming is another lie. 
In other places, which we'll look at today, Zarathustra describes life in terms of will to power, which is apparently a consistent, enduring principle. Wouldn't that be a kind of permanence? Or perhaps we could consider the eternalization of our lives within the context of the eternal recurrence, which would mean, if we take it seriously, that everything physical is actually permanent, right? It's permanent in its sort of fluid ever dynamic state, right? But the parable of your life, the story of your life always plays out the same way. And like the superposition is the same, we might say. And so the whole idea of permanence as but a parable would itself be incorrect. It would be, Zarathustra would be the lying poet in saying that. Uh, from that perspective, if we take the eternal return very literally. And so there are endless ways to interpret this. And rather than give us a canonical interpretation, Zarathustra instead seemingly goes off on a non sequitur from the main point, um, which ends up being the topic of the chapter. I mean, when asked to explain himself, he explains why he can't really explain himself. And so we started out talking about life as an embodied existence, not the permanence of spirit, but now the passage is about Zarathustra's own, own untrustworthiness. And I think it's digressions like these in the book Zarathustra that can throw off some readers. But is it a non sequitur? I mean, is there some connecting tissue for this passage? On closer examination, Zarathustra's expla explanation that he gives of why he can't be trusted is because his thoughts, the abstract productions of his intellect, are merely memories, the experiences of yesterday. To Zarathustra, uh, who he is as the body and its impulses, um, which is, it's not dependent on memory in any sense. M most of the self is subconscious. It strings the conscious intellect along. Our thoughts are like a superficial surface and skin, a conscious gloss on reality. The reality that's first and foremost physical and driven by physical need, physical desire, physical instincts. And this even applies to our philosophizing, as Nietzsche argues in Beyond Good and Evil, that the philosopher is merely giving a voice to whatever, whatever um, as he put it, moral or immoral aims are deep within him. Uh, he says the philosopher is giving a confession. He's telling us who he is, revealing his deepest instincts of thought. And so Zarathustra compares his own thoughts to birds. Uh, his conscious mind is just like a little roost for a bunch of thought birds to come and make their nests, and some of which are not even his. You know, he says that sometimes he finds foreign thoughts in his mind that have flown in from somewhere else and they don't really belong to him. Like they, they tremble as he places his hand on them. So carrying around his reasons for things he said and did is something Zarathustra dismisses because our conscious reasons for doing things are not themselves the truth. He doesn't want to become a barrel full of reasons because reasons bring us no closer to that, uh, that raw physical truth. And thus we might recall Nietzsche's statement in daybreak that the consciousness is a commentary on an unknown text. And what Nietzsche has done here in this new conception of the body is that he's given us a holy mystery. Throughout his work, he attempts to humble the conscious mind before the body. Humble reason before the importance of passion. And thus, the ultimate spiritualization of the body is to make the physical body akin to the way that we have conceived of spirit in such a way as to give power to spirit in our conception of it. And so, in Nietzsche's philosophy, the body is the Lord issuing commandments to the conscious mind. You know, that's your, the conscious mind uh, in its relationship to the body. Uh, you know, the people who have difficulties in life or fail, failings of the will, we might compare them to a... Uh, a defiant center whose, uh, you know, ego consciousness is compelling him to defy the, uh, 
dictates the natural order that issue from his Lord, which is, should be his body, right? Uh, and the body is a mystery to us. Just as no one knows the mind of God, none of us may know the true nature of our own inner life, where the deepest drives and impulses within us come from. Nietzsche insists on unconscious origins of all our motives and even our philosophical ideas. And so our attempt to have control over the world through our own self-conscious rationality has to yield to a love of fate. And in this formulation, uh, I think it's important I did not say faith, uh, even though I could see one uh, reaching for such a term. But the reason I didn't is because Nietzsche has this perhaps unusual way of presenting his ideas, uh, which may be relatively rare within philosophy. He tells us that we shouldn't really believe him and that Zarathustra is not a reliable source and that therefore it's not appropriate for you to follow Nietzsche, who is only human all too human, and that having faith in his religion is not a sacrament but a kind of sin. Assuming that, it, I mean, we even permit the idea of sin. But I mean, have you ever heard of religion like that? You know, a lot of religions will claim the specific point of their uniqueness, right? You hear it all the time. Um, you know, I've heard uh, Christians say the uniqueness of their religion is that their God lives in, lived and died in human form, right? Became, he, he lived the, the, through the suffering and the, uh, the mortality that we all live with, right? Um, so what's the uniqueness in Nietzsche's religion? I, I would say faith, which is so fundamental to every religious tradition that the word faith is itself a synonym for a religious tradition in the sense we talk about people of many different faiths, right? But Nietzsche, uh, or Zarathustra, rejects faith. And it would even be hard to call that a sin the way I did earlier. Um, I mean, every religion tends to have a concept of sin too, whatever they might call it. But Zarathustra's reaction to someone's misplaced faith in him is not chastisement or even forgiveness, but uh, just uh, he laughs and shakes his head. Uh, you know, the way a parent might laugh at their child. You know, it's like a, making a simple innocent mistake or something like that. It's not. A, it's a good-hearted laugh. It's not. Um, at least that's the read I get off the passage. So just to put what we're talking about in context here, uh, we're coming to the end of the season of the podcast, um, and I wanted to give a summary of Nietzsche's revaluation, and particularly his affirmative philosophy as we have explored it, um, which means describing this new form of spirituality or um, anti-spirituality and saying what it means in practical terms to begin following the value of life. And uh, furthermore, uh, to hopefully give a sort of synthesis to all the major ideas we've covered this season, um, the overman, the eternal return, will to power, amor fati. What does life look like to us when all these philosophical pieces are fitted into place? Um, and when life is understood from this new foundation of um, you know, the body as the root of it all. And nevertheless, in that affirmative philosophy, we have to do this with an awareness of this particular tendency in Nietzsche that to tell us not to follow him and to find our own way and to remember that he could be lying to us and that, in fact, the poets always lie. And so we must include this element within the summary of what the meaning of life is for Nietzsche, because this affects how we might integrate Nietzsche into our life. Because the answer cannot be, well, now we have this blueprint, these do-it-yourself instructions, step one, step two, step three, for how to become what one is, right? None of these concepts or figures, uh, such as the overman or the spirit of gravity, have any more actual reality to them than God or the devil did, right? And ultimately, there can never be an orthodox presentation of the Nietzschean message. Now, I believe that one can, in spite of that, create a coherent and accurate presentation of Nietzschean affirmative philosophy, and that we can say definitively, 
what it is Nietzsche asserted, what he criticized, what he admired, what he rejected, as evidenced by what he writes in his own books. Uh, the postmodern position is really not my own. Uh, like I think there are more accurate interpretations of Nietzsche than others, um, even though all interpretations are physical are, are, are uh, fictional. Excuse me, uh, quite the opposite of physical. You know, I I think I can hold both of those propositions, and I would say to Nietzsche himself who sometimes wrote things implying that the interpretation of a work is all there is, uh, that Nietzsche is indeed correct, that the poets like Nietzsche lie too much. And I don't believe him on that particular point. Um, But when we go beyond the philosophical or theoretical and into the practical, into the specifics, um, Zarathustra's preachments not to follow him and to discover your own path become very, very relevant. And there's some sense in which any useful life advice will always be contextual and relative. Any code of virtue or behavior, when extended to be completely general, will simply become another form of universal morality, of an ought imposed on existence and therefore a judgment passed on existence. And so Nietzsche and life philosophy always must avoid this. And so these limitations, um, they don't make the challenge of describing Nietzsche's affirmative philosophy uh, impossible. I mean, quite the contrary, they set the boundaries of what such a thing might look like. And so we have to the, we have to refine the question and ask, is there any way to do this without falling victim to dogmatism or to violating the spirit of Nietzsche's philosophy? And it's a pressing question to me because it's demanded uh, that we derive some practical application in order to say that Nietzsche's philosophy has mattered at all and in order to integrate his philosophy into our lives. Um, and so what is his answer to the life problem? If we can't make that answer real in our own lives, then is it really an answer? And so it's a bit of a different question than we normally ask on the podcast. And I, I should say, um, what we normally do on this podcast is philology, really. I mean, there's some philosophizing involved, but mostly what I'm doing here is less akin to what Nietzsche did when he was writing his books up in Sils Maria and more like what Nietzsche was doing when he was studying the Greek philosophers at Basel. Um, Although probably nowhere near the skill level of either Nietzsche, but, uh, you know, it's philology. We're studying the history of ideas. Um, and so, but I, I don't want to just try and catalog Nietzsche's ideas and the ideas of his influences. I want to sincerely engage with figures from the past. I want to learn what it is that they thought and felt. And I want to know the context of their lives as a background for their thought. And I don't want to do this in order to judge them or affix a label, either moral or a qualitative judgment. I mean, sometimes that still happens because we're human. We judge all the time. Uh, and so, you know, that's man is the measure of all things, right? That's what it means to be a mensch in German. The etymological root suggests man is a measurer. So naturally we make judgments and oftentimes we feel it's our prerogative to judge philosophers and other figures from history as to whether their ideas are worthy of us. Um, or sometimes, uh, what we want to do is take our own ideas from today and simply project them onto past figures in order to to claim someone, you know, Jesus was a socialist or Jesus was a libertarian, that sort of thing. Um, but here I think we can learn a great deal from Nietzsche's own example of how he treated the Greek philosophers when he himself was a philologist. And a sincere practice of philology involves a sort of oath not to project yourself onto past figures and not to judge past figures relative to your time or interpret them anachronistically um, or, you know, judge them in accord with events that haven't happened yet or standards they didn't hold or facts they didn't know about. To really get to know someone and get into their head, uh, it's not when you try to figure out what you yourself think of a, of a figure from history, like be it Nietzsche or Heraclitus or Emerson, Schopenhauer or Goethe or Plato, but instead, when we try to figure out what would all of those people think of me? And I think that's 
how you really enter into a dialogue with artists and thinkers from history. Um, Cause we're always going to put our own judgment on them. So what you really need is two way communication, right? So figure out what they would be telling you about your life and then you can pass your judgments and have your assessment anyway. I feel we, we've done that with Nietzsche throughout uh, this podcast. Uh, but as we've are already considered, Nietzsche is so aware of this danger of dogmatism being attached to his own ideas that he can't present it as specific universal moral advice. As I've said, we're going to try and infer some general principles from his statements, but in the final analysis, Nietzsche presents his ideas in such a way that there is no universal doctrine or way of life. And it's not just because Nietzsche doesn't want disciples, but because he would argue there is no universal way of life for human beings and that all of us in the end must find our own way, whether you want to believe that that's something you have to do or not. It's simply the reality. And what's good for one person is not necessarily good for another. And we all have our lies and fables within our conscious gloss of thought, which may be appropriate for us, but not for others. So everyone has to become what he or she is on their own terms. Um, And people are always looking to abdicate our own authority and our own responsibility for our will and defer to some authority which is beyond ourselves. And Nietzsche, quite simply, will not let us do that with him and his ideas. And that's the last thing he wants. Rather, he wants to put you in a position such that your will and the nature of your own character and instincts can be made clearer to yourself, such that you're in a better position to realize your greatest potential. Um, And there doesn't need to be free will in this process. It's simply a fact that with more awareness of yourself, you gain more knowledge, uh, you gain relevant knowledge over your own life. And never has the acquisition of new knowledge limited one's options. It may reveal to you that an option you thought you had didn't really exist, but that doesn't really take anything away since it was never really there to begin with. Um, So that it's an increase in one's power, right? Uh, We might say, since limiting out the options that would bring harm to yourself is not a decrease in your power when we fully think that proposition through. And so an honest awareness of ourselves and our own nature, because of the mystery of our own subconscious and instinctual life, it can very well be a a lifelong quest for self-knowledge. This isn't something, you know, you might think, okay, I'm going to make the nature of myself and my drives clearer to myself. How do I do that? What's the three-step process, right? It's a lifelong process. And since we've all started it, we have to carry it through to the end now. Uh, Nietzsche writes in the preface to Genealogy of Morality, quote, we are strangers to ourselves, we men of knowledge, end quote. The, the knowledge of ourselves is the thing we find farthest away, especially those of us who like to think in these explicit, abstract, conceptual ways. This world of thought, this world of the mind, of Geist, it's the farthest thing away from the physical reality of the body, though, and the deep impulses that really drive us, because the intellect, the imagination has become so free as to become increasingly untethered in its productions from any physical limitations. And the more objective and abstract we become in our thought, the less we're able to intuitively understand ourselves as subjects. Um, And so that is the great quandary set before us men of knowledge. Um, In any case, it's not possible, as I've said, to give a canonical view of the, the Nietzschean life, right? Or a canonical set of Nietzschean virtues. Uh, or a definitive vision of what the overman would be like. Um, I think it is, on the other hand, quite possible to say, in general terms, what Nietzsche thinks life is, and what he thinks the good life is. We could address ourselves to that way of looking at the question of the meaning of life. Um, And so, actually, I mean, we really could break down this most frequently asked of existential questions into its constituent parts and answer the question as Nietzsche or Zarathustra might answer it, um, answer each question and keeping in mind that this is more of a, an art than a science here. Uh, as we kind of go over how I think each of these questions might be answered, but 
Here are four aspects, actually, that I think will cover most of what people are asking about when they inquire about the so-called meaning of life. So first one may ask, what is life? Second, what is the good life? Third, how to facilitate the good life? And finally, how to confront death? So let us address ourselves to the first question. Uh, I'll give the Nietzschean foundation for answering it. What is life? We approach that question uh, with a resistance to metaphysics. That is to say, a repudiation of the traditional belief that we must begin with a set of first principles or employ our reason in order to transcend the limitations of our senses. Instead, we start from the immediate sense perception. That doesn't mean we're dogmatic about what it is these senses indicate or what the quote-unquote true nature of the world really is. It's simply that those questions must be tabled, because this true world, so long as it's conceived of as this mind-independent reality, a reality which exists in some objective form, outside of and independent of any human perception of it, has been recognized to be a useless concept. It's a misleading bypath. Instead, we simply take the world as revealed to us by the senses as the real world. Uh, good enough. Secondly, when we apply our reason, we see that the world behaves according to patterns and laws, which can be apprehended by the senses. And this doesn't mean that these patterns are universal or mind independent, because we've done away with those notions already as a sort of first principle. See, I just said it. So <laughs> I'm like laying out first principles and the first principle is to do away with first principles. All right, moving on to second principle. Um, you see how it's like uh, it, <laughs> almost impossible to um, talk about this in a coherent way, but I think what he's saying still makes sense, actually. Um, so really, the what we're getting at here is that it seems the behavior of matter can be explained via the properties of matter, that we don't, we don't find an indication of some power beyond the world without which the world can't be explained. Uh, rather, we perceive that the power which is driving the world is within the world itself. Uh, in past ages, figures such as Spinoza believed that there was an eminent quality of the divine in all things which animated the world. And this notion was carried on to like some of the most important scientific figures, such as Newton, who believed that motion had to be explained by an appeal to God. And we find when we look back in Western civilization all the way to the time of the Preplatonics, we have Empedocles, who posits a first cause, which started all the processes we perceive in reality. With the atheistic Schopenhauer, Nietzsche found the ingredient he needed to overcome this, a quality within the world, within life, within the things of existence, which is not itself created by something outside the world. Schopenhauer's system was atheistic, and yet he believed that the world on the most fundamental level was will. And when we look inward in Schopenhauer's writing, he says, you look inward, you get in touch with the deepest reality of our being, we perceive that what we are is will. Then that's the inner intelligible character of life. The will for Schopenhauer is in all things. All phenomena are a manifestation of it. It's completely undivided and only appears to be that way. To, to be divided in all these different forms due to our representations of it. But it's, uh, what does he say? It's not increased when new things are born or decreased when something dies. It exists uh, equally in all things. And it always has been and always will be because it's not subject to time. Time is simply another representation. Uh, when individuals arise, the will doesn't increase. They pass away. It doesn't diminish. Um, that's Schopenhauer's view. And so Nietzsche was materialistic insofar as he believes that the world's behavior, the motion of it, you know, the world, uh, the patterns, the laws we discussed, are not explained by anything outside of the world. And yet, like Schopenhauer, Nietzsche believes there is an inner content to phenomena, an intelligible character to them. He also calls it will, but while Schopenhauer believed that the fundamental form of the will was ontological, meaning it's a true character of being, which exists independently of the world of phenomena. Um, 
And furthermore, Schopenhauer believes it manifests as self-preservation because it's a will towards continued existence and towards duration. Nietzsche believes instead uh, in a Boscovician world, uh, which is a world of multiplicity. And the basis of all those wills is the will to power. What this means is not a will to duration, but a will to expand, to conquer, to dominate, to make itself felt, to make its impact felt, to overcome, and to create beyond oneself. Uh, We might say to attempt to give rise to something better for whatever that might mean. In perhaps not the same ontological sense as Schopenhauer, Nietzsche nevertheless thinks that these various drives are all really the same thing, that they, we might say a better way to put it is they can all be explained by the same principle of will to power. And he does at certain times even go as far to ask us to sort of dare to undertake the thought experiment of considering that in terms of our subjective experience, the only intelligible character of the world is will to power. Now, if this is the world's inner character, its intelligible inner character, will to power, some of us might immediately recognize that there's at least an apparent contradiction. How can Nietzsche reject metaphysics but posit a true character of the world, which is beyond the senses in some sense, right? When we look around, uh, do we see will to power with the senses? Uh, And if not, wouldn't it be an abstract thing? But Nietzsche believes there is an observable basis to will to power, which we can perceive with our senses. And uh, like Heraclitus, he would say that will to power is not an ontological reality behind things, but something which is revealed in the behavior of all the things that we perceive. Um, And so, you know, for example, on the level of physics, Will to power is Boscovich's unified field theory, a single equation which describes how every force, every pattern, every law and reality, as we perceive them, manifests according to the distance at which it acts. All things are force points that push and strive for and against one another, and he explains both attraction and repulsion with the same equation. On the level of biology, will to power is not so much a drive for preservation, as we've said, but the drives for nourishment and procreation. Nietzsche argues that nature is a great squanderer, that it can be wasteful, arbitrary, and so on. The individual of the species is never preserved. I mean, quite the opposite. Really, none of them are preserved. But the species survives if nourishment and reproduction continue. And so that is the, uh, that is the pattern that we perceive, right? That's the, the parable. Right, And so this is a drive to exist, yes, but part of Nietzsche's point is that it's not really descriptive to say that something merely strives to exist, because um, that, that doesn't explain animate matter at all of life, why we engage in action or motion. Uh, it's a criticism he levels at Schopenhauer that we already exist now, and if the will driving life is simply a will for us to continue existing, then we're driven to do a thing we're already doing we're striving to attain something we already have. Um, it doesn't tell us anything about the actual character of existence. It creates a strange circle that things exist for the sake of continuing to exist. So why then would life uh, generate itself, generate new forms? Um, why would forms arise that move themselves about and consume things and make offspring? Nietzsche's counter description is that life is engaged in this process of striving to find nourishment, which means consume and extract energy from other forms within the ecosystem, and to reproduce the process by which the organism creates beyond itself. Uh, He says that organisms don't seek to preserve themselves, but to discharge their strength, that life is a positive phenomenon, not positive in the sense of good necessarily, but essentially generating, self-generating, doing so by giving rise to things in a long, active process of differentiation as all things strive to be different, to be distinctive, to express power in their own particular way. And thus Nietzsche would say, in our understanding of genetic mutation, for example, and its role in evolution 
on the macro scale, you know, the process of speciation, we have a phenomenon that's described by will to power. Uh, on the level of human psychology or human sociality, will to power is an explanatory principle for human action also. I mean, in one sense, power or potency is a prerequisite for acting at all. And in terms of examining human motivations, we find the desire to become powerful and to, to feel powerful and to manifest power at the root of all of them. Nietzsche argues, for example, that there's no truly selfless act because all selfless acts emerge from a foundation of selfishness. In fact, selfishness and selflessness are not opposites at all, but gradations of the same thing. That our motivations can be coarse or refined, such that both the philanthropist and the car thief are both expressing their will to power, or to, to put it another way, our identity can be complex and individual or rigid and inherited. Uh, like the difference between us children of the age, you know, of, uh, of authenticity, of discovering our true selves, um, and someone placed in, into a role in Chinese society by which he gains his identity by family and class. Um, and so we can see how in various circumstances or different cultural contexts um, different types of motivations or different types of identities or means of uh, gaining one could be your means of advancing um, but they all we see a will to power as a fundamental principle in all of these and finally uh, I mean just on the moral level or the meta moral level Nietzsche argues all moralities that have ever been created involve an element of self-overcoming, shy of the basest hedonism in which one abandons discipline and restraint altogether and lives purely according to one's impulses. Any system of right and wrong requires that one overcomes impulses, instincts, feelings, either abstaining altogether, withholding from indulging, or doing so only in like a proper context. All morality is the attempt for the self to challenge itself to challenge its own weaknesses and shortcomings and become something greater. And so all of these are aspects of human life. And what life is, is will to power from every single one of those perspectives for Nietzsche, as something that he sees revealed empirically uh, in the world. And it, it's... It, it, will to power is the intelligible content which is generalizable across all of these perspectives. And Nietzsche believes this, again, not because it's something we find when we look deep within ourselves, which is what like Schopenhauer's means, trying to get over the uh, phenomena noumena chasm. Uh, you know, although I, I would argue that Nietzsche probably does believe that if we did that honestly, we would discover will to power. But that's not his reasoning for for seeing it everywhere in the world, right? But it's because it's manifest in all these observable um, phenomena. And thus, whatever the world might be, independent of the human mind, we can say without a doubt that the world for us, the world as we experience it, is will to power. Will to power is the simplest most fundamental statement of what the world is like without an appeal to anything outside of it being necessary and without invoking uh, a divine personality or an intelligence or purpose to life. In this view, life has no transcendent value. That is to say, a value imposed upon it from a world that is above it. And it has no purpose, Nietzsche says, unless the circuit of eternal recurrence itself is a purpose. And it has no intelligence, except insofar as we're a part of it and we're intelligent. But it seems that our intelligence comes out of a blind, unintelligent world in which intelligence is not the rule, but the exception. So now we'll look at a couple of Nietzsche passages on life. Uh, the first is his rebuke to the Stoics. Stoicism represents an attempt to master one's passions so that one's not carried away by their emotions and one doesn't attach to one's current circumstances. Um, you know, a common practice might be to visualize what tragedies can and will befall you. Um, and so the Stoic 
lives in the knowledge of nature, of what nature is really like. Uh, all its forms are fleeting and impermanent, including us. And this is all uh, just to give context. I'm not really reading this because of Nietzsche's attack on the Stoics, but rather because of what he says about life and nature in this section. And so this is section nine of Beyond Good and Evil. Quote, According to nature, you want to live. O oh, you noble Stoics, what deceptive words these are. Imagine a being like nature, wasteful beyond measure, indifferent beyond measure, without purposes and consideration, without mercy and justice, fertile and desolate and uncertain at the same time. Imagine indifference itself as a power. How could you live according to this indifference? Is that not precisely wanting to be other than this nature? Is not living, estimating, preferring, being unjust, being limited, wanting to be different? And supposing your imperative, live according to nature, meant at bottom as much as live according to life, how could you not do that? Why make a principle of what you yourselves are and must be? End quote. So very wonderful passage. Um, what's funny about it is, uh, and, and what's funny about Nietzsche's criticism of the Stoics is that I think these charges could be levied at him to some extent. Um, I mean, if, if Nietzsche is to have a life-affirming philosophy, right, is he not guilty of also extolling us to live according to life? But I would argue um, being life-affirming affirming does not mean that Nietzsche is affirming a certain path of life as more natural or closer to life than others. Rather, with Nietzsche's insight, one could choose to accept the fundamental nature of what life is or not. Um, one could be grateful for being alive or not. Um, but whether you are of one temperament or the other has nothing to do with Nietzsche, right? Um, <clears throat> And I think Nietzsche has a real point that many philosophers and many ideologies and religions throughout time have ultimately been anti-life. Um, and so I would, because I think that is a meaningful thing to talk about what is anti-life, I would reject the argument that it's like a meaningless distinction. There are real examples of people who have said no to life, right? Schopenhauer, Christianity, Buddhism, and so on. Um, Nietzsche's I mean, and you know, if of course, if you phrase it to a Christian, like, are you anti-life? Virtually no Christian's going to say yes to that. But if you ask them in more specific terms, like, is your, you know, is your like, what is your life here worth compared to what your, uh, whether your soul is saved to go to heaven worth? I mean, they'll all tell you that that the latter is way more important, right? Um. And so I, I think Nietzsche's definition of these ideologies as anti-life uh, and distinguishing them from what a life-affirming philosophy would be is actually descriptive. Um, whether we would agree that it, he successfully applied, creates a philosophy of life or not, right? But on the other hand, um, so Nietzsche here, he's making a principle of will to power. And if will to power is life, why make a principle of what we ourselves are and must be? And perhaps the only answer here is that Nietzsche is simply raising this truth into our consciousness, and I don't think he imagines that he can in any fundamental way change the driving force of reality in all human life. And that again, by expanding our knowledge and our understanding, we gain a greater, more complete perspective. And if it happens to follow from this, that you make changes to your life or your way of life, then so much the better. But just as Zarathustra doesn't want us to follow him, um, and wants to remind us that the poets lie too much, I think we can be safe in saying Nietzsche, um, well, he doesn't ever lay out a, a list of, like, these are the proper ways to manifest your will to power, right? That's sort of what I'm getting at. Now, he does show ways that are, hmm, he points out examples where, manif where will to power is turned against itself, and uh, so that's sort of, you know, it's like if you, <laughs> if you care about life, you should probably avoid the ways in which your life is going to be um, 
self-defeating or self-undermining, right? Um, but uh, we'll discuss this more, you know, as, as we go on. Um, but so from this, des- this description of what life is, indifferent, desolate, and abundant at the same time, arbitrary and cruel in a sense. Um, so suppose we agree with that definition. And supposing this perception of what life is has been raised into our consciousness, the world would now appear differently. And our own way of life could be brought under a more critical eye. We might have grounds to make new judgments and assessments. Um, And that's very important because what comes out in this passage is living as judging, evaluating, which is something I made reference to earlier, but... As Nietzsche says in this quote, life is, quote, estimating, preferring, being unjust, being limited, wanting to be different, end quote. Life is not a primarily self-preservative force. It's a generating force. What life is, is not the passing on of the same genes. That isn't really the essence of life. It would be, the essence of life would be, again, mutation, endlessly individuating forms, becoming more complex, more rarefied, more specialized, more speciated. And notice this process is fundamentally just as innocent as it is arbitrary and unjust. These preferences, these judgments aren't founded in reason. Um, You know, they're just expressions of the drives within the organisms reaching out into the world, reacting physiologically when something gives pain or pleasure or when something appears ugly or beautiful. Um, And so, for example, whether you find someone else attractive or not, beautiful or not, it's not in any way the product of a rational syllogism or a well-considered argument or a moral imperative. Um, And when I, to speak for myself, when I look at the most important things in my life, I find almost uh, none of them derive from these things, right? Life's judgments are spontaneous, non-rational preferences. Uh, It's direct valuation on an intuitive level. Uh, let's look at another passage describing what life is. I, I, probably the most important one from Thus Spoke Zarathustra. This is an excerpt from On Self-Overcoming, which is a chapter from the second part of the novel. Again, Zarathustra speaks to us on the essence of living, and he recounts things that he has heard in an encounter with the character of life itself, life personified. And as the context for the passage, Zarathustra prefaces all this by saying that he's telling us this story so we understand his words on good and evil. So we cannot understand Zarathustra's morality and his condemnation of good versus evil type moral systems until we understand what he believes about life and living. And so the passage, quote, Wherever I found the living, There I heard also the speech on obedience. Whatever lives, obeys. And this is the second point. He who cannot obey himself is commanded. That is the nature of the living. This, however, is the third point that I heard, that commanding is harder than obeying. And not only because he who commands must carry the burden of all who obey, and because this burden may easily crush him. An experiment in hazard appeared to me to be in all commanding, and whenever the living commands, it hazards itself. Indeed, even when it commands itself, it must still pay for its commanding. It must become the judge, avenger, and the victim of its own law. End quote. And so, remember, morality is self-overcoming, that's the inner character of morality is will to power, like everything else. Uh, what is morality? It is, in the language of this passage, issuing commands to oneself. Completely absent from this vision is anything like freedom of the will or the libertarian application of uh, you know some quality of reason to govern human action. Rather, it's simply a question of whether one has the strength to command oneself. And if not, then one shall be commanded by his drives, rather than the other way around. There's no detente, no equilibrium. The choice is to command or be commanded. And um, in a way, 
in a way they both sort of imply, uh, one another. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, the idea is that it's always better to be commander too, is short-sighted. All life is an experiment and most experiments fail, right? So to dare to allow your judgments, your non-rational arbitrary preferences that your will is aimed at to reshape your world and to even bind others' wills to your own, um, or just on the more basic level, to take command of your own life and reshape it into an artistic pattern, right? Giving style, as Nietzsche says. These are dangerous experiments, and most people throughout history do not do this experiment. Most people throughout time live their life in accord with the inherited conventional pattern. And yet, there's this driving will beneath us all, and always this tendency for some number of us to burst forward attempting to be different and to define ourselves individually. And, you know, like, but how many aquatic life forms suffocated above the water until some muta- some of them mutated into forms that could endure, like, more and more exposure to the oxygen atmosphere, right? So advancement requires vast sacrifices. And as this passage indicates, we always have to, we always have to pay for it in some way. It's a reality of life. Um, but the passage gets uh, tougher still quote, where I found the living there, I found will to power. And even in the will of those who serve, I found the will to be master that the weaker should serve the stronger To that, it is persuaded by its own will, which would be master over what is weaker still. This is the one pleasure it does not want to renounce. And as the smaller yields to the greater, that it may have pleasure and power over the smallest, thus even the greatest still yields, and for the sake of power risks life. That is the yielding of the greater. It is hazard and danger and casting dice for death. And where men make sacrifices and serve and cast amorous glances, there too is the will to be master. Along stealthy paths, the weaker steals into the castle and into the very heart of the more powerful, and there steals power. And life confided the secret to me. Behold, it said, I am that which must always overcome itself. Indeed, you call it a will to procreate, or a drive to an end, to something higher, farther, more manifold. But all this is one, and one secret. Rather would I perish than forswear this. And verily, where there is perishing and a falling of leaves, behold, there life sacrifices itself for power that I must be a struggle and a becoming and an end and an opposition to ends. Alas, whoever guesses what is my will should also guess on what crooked paths it must proceed. Whatever I create and however much I love it, soon I must oppose it and my love. Thus my will wills it. And you too, lover of knowledge, are only a path and a footprint of my will. My will to power walks also on the heels of your will to truth. Indeed, the truth was not hit by him who shot at it with the word of will to existence. That will does not exist. For what does not exist cannot will. But what is in existence, how could that still want existence? Only where there is life is there also will. Not will to life, but, thus I teach you, will to power. There is much that life esteems more highly than life itself. But out of the esteeming itself speaks will to power. End quote. So we have the repudiation at the end there of Schopenhauer's idea of the will to exist or the will to live. We have the idea that life is that which overcomes itself and that life sacrifices itself for power and that this is the fundamental nature of will to power 
meaning life itself is will to power, is self overcoming self. Life is judging, appraising, being different. As we, if we were to draw in from the other pa passage, um, and the basis of all of this is physiological preference, and as such, the nature of life is valuing. Another way of saying that is how he brings it out at the end here, saying that to live is to esteem. And if we are to be the measure of things, which all life must be for itself and for its own kind, then we must self-legislate that good, just as the hawk must determine its own good and the lamb must determine its own good, right? But we humans, it's a little different because we perhaps value more powerfully and more subtly than any other being ever has. And that's why our will to power proceeds on crooked paths. Even those in a position of servitude have their ways of gaining power over the masters. We can find the expressions of will to power in the most subtle ways, whether in charity and patronage or in subterfuge and infidelity. All manner of human behaviors and tendencies present themselves in our cognition as wholly separate from this fundamental character of life. We hide it behind ideas like the search for the truth. But the high estimation of truth, just like the estimations we make of any phenomena, speak to the fact that esteeming itself is our nature. Judging, valuing, measuring is nature. It is a prerequisite for any such valuation. And within this fundamental activity, we see the essence of will to power. The willingness to impose our standards upon reality. And then manifest those standards with force. And when we zoom out, so to speak, and consider the total picture of life, life as a whole is always doing this, meaning that life is constantly judging which forms or biological patterns are worthy of esteem and which ones are not, insofar as this war of all against all takes place continually across generations of life forms, all eating each other and competing for the feeding ground and the right to reproduce. So with this perhaps uh, somewhat troubling picture of what life is and who we are as living beings, is there such a thing as the good life? Nietzsche would obviously say yes, and uh, although his conception of it changes a little bit throughout his career. In his early days, he believes that life can be aesthetically justified. This is as he writes in uh, Birth of Tragedy, and this has a sense to it if life is basically arbitrary estimations on the direct perceptual level why can't the good life simply be the beautiful life if we're living according to brute preference why not aesthetic preference um, <clears throat> this particular form of aesthetic preference nietzsche advocates is what we might call the tragic perspective on life this is the perspective cultivated artistically through dramatic tragedy in ancient Greece, of a cheerful fatalism in the face of one's destruction. We can better understand this view by what Nietzsche opposes it to. He opposes this view to what he calls the theoretic approach, which begins with Socrates. In Birth of Tragedy, he writes of the cultural divide between the theoretic and the tragic. The theoretical life is a life lived according to reason, according to the view that human problems can be solved by reason in a lasting way, and human life and society can be improved by reason. It is fundamentally a form of optimism, and the best representative for it is Socrates, because he offers the strongest and most noteworthy case for this worldview. An Im important point in all this is that Socrates' view is, for Nietzsche, ultimately an aesthetic view. Socrates is at bottom driven by an irrational estimation of the truth. That's uh, Nietzsche's fundamental criticism of him. And I think the various paths of ideas or thoughts that one could follow just from the explosive quality of that initial statement, you know, that initial accusation in Nietzsche's career, it contains all the seeds of Nietzsche's later philosophy. But in any case, so he presents Socrates in Birth of Tragedy as totally unartistic, but he clarifies in his later preface to the work that Socrates' irony is that very thing, that he irrationally valued the truth about all things, and that this is in itself an expression of Socrates' underlying nature. His arbitrary demand for life, 
his demand that all reality be bound under one universal principle of reason, and that all illusions of superstition and prejudice be banned because under this Socratic aesthetic, those things are ugly. And so uh, it's all Socrates' aesthetic judgment. And he questions, was that, oh, great ironist, was that perhaps your irony? Now, Nietzsche's opposing aesthetic outlook is one which is pessimistic. And again, Nietzsche believes he's a rather positive representative of the outlook because he believes himself to be a pessimist of strength. And thus the tragic worldview is the affirmation of all of the character of life that we just discussed with the full realization that this entails the embrace of one's own downfall. We do not accept any optimistic or morally redeeming narratives about life and embrace wholeheartedly that entropy always wins. Life is short. The good die young. Bad things happen to good people. Pride comes before the fall. History is a series of cycles of a rise followed by a fall, just like all organisms are born and then they die. But one does not count any of these honestly ascertained aspects of human life as charges against it. The tragic aesthetic instead is defined by emphasizing the beauty inherent to the fundamentally entropic nature of life. The story seen in total of a tragic figure is somehow beautiful to us. And Nietzsche believes that this experience occurs when we engage with the tragic because we are confronting the terrifying reality of life in such a manner that it does not immediately destroy us, right? And so we feel that we are through the experience of tragic art, overcoming the terrifying nature of the world by encountering it and surviving it. And by that token, uh, to use a heretical word in this context, transcending it and turning it into art, the experience of uh, beauty or the sublime. Now, Nietzsche didn't stick with this answer as to what the good life is, because this answer, I mean, like any other answer to the question of what the good life is, is perspectival. To really answer the question in general terms, we have to make it into a meta question. What later Nietzsche eventually concludes in a mindset more of that type in the meta world, uh, what he later concludes, it's related to his understanding of what every attempt at creating the good life has been. And that is the will to power. That the will to power is expressed in the Socratic quest to know the truth in order to practice virtue, as much as will to power is expressed in the Christian ethos, to love thy enemy and resist not evil, or the Buddhist ethos to renounce selfish craving. All are forms of self-overcoming, and all are attempts to impose a judgment on the world. Nietzsche then inquires about the direction in which this transformation proceeds or how these judgments on the world um, eventually manifest in human life. And the reason why he does this is because in seeing that element of will to power and all of these answers and how each one is sort of from a different perspective, right? But it's always manifesting this will to power thing. Um, I think he's able to see that his own attempt to impose an aesthetic judgment on the world was actually not a new or innovative thing at all or innovative notion um, that uh, it's simply what every religion has been trying to do and that the real question that we should be asking is why is it that <laughs> all of these aesthetics that already exist do not work for us anymore that might be one way to put it so what is it that these various moralities and religions have given rise to? And in a strong sense, Nietzsche is very empirical here. All the various manifestations of the will to power have these fundamental characteristics that we've described, but not all its manifestations are created equal. Accordingly, some ways of life are stronger and some are weaker, or we might say healthier or sicker, or to put it in the language we used earlier, some are ascending paths of life meaning that these are expressions of strength which give rise to more strength, but some are descending, which represents a degeneration into weaker and weaker forms. So it's still a manifestation of your strength, but it's a manifestation of your strength that 
get, doesn't give rise to more strength, but to, um, but to weakness. And so um, it's the difference between a positive feedback loop and a negative feedback loop. And so the good life is the positive feedback loop. That is the healthy life in the sense of the, the life affirming life, right? And we should remind ourselves at this point that while the statement does have a very figurative dimension to it, it also has a very um, literal dimension because the, the root of this all is still what? Physiological. Our judgments and preferences occur at that physiological level. And so one's strength to order their drives uh, according to such a life ascending manifestation of will that's determined at the physiological level. If we're going to take seriously the idea that human beings are bodies, that what we are is what we appear to be by all observation in the world of direct perception, then we're physical beings and our psychic life in the sense of the psychological, right? Um, as well as our social life and there our moral life, all of this sort of flows out of the headwaters of our own nature, of the conditions that produced us, aspects of our temperament. Um, but another way to look at it would be like maybe how much physical vitality we have. Or we might say, how much vitality do we have left? And so Nietzsche believes that weak or self-undermining moral values, for example, are at bottom the product of a weary, degenerating person. <laughs> and that this is true in some sense uh, of them physiologically as well as psychologically. And so that's the root of everything we are. So we, we look at it in the physical sense. Um, I mean, on the other hand, though, it's entirely possible for someone who's young and otherwise physiologically healthy to have a weary or degenerative view of life. Um, and life is not a frozen thing. Again, it's not being. So we can't inquire as to whether someone's way of life is apparently healthy uh, in the here and now and then have done with it, right? We are viewing people as human becomings rather than human beings, as a dynamic process which is ever unfolding and never really standing still. And so, like with everything, we can't really say whether a life is healthy until we know what it led to. What did it give rise to, right? And so we always have to remember in pursuing the good life, um, the important thing is what we spend our lives, uh, what are we... What direction are we moving in? What are we bringing forth? If we try to hold on to our life or hold on to it the way it is now from a devotion to the self-preservative instinct, we'll, we'll always fail in that task, right? When it's all over, you'll be gone anyway. And, and uh, all that's going to be left is whatever it is you've given rise to. It's not really an option. But so what is the good life to Nietzsche? We're still sort of answering this question. And with all of that, all those pieces into place, we could say um, this is where the concept of the ever man comes into play. It's the good life is in so many words to live in such a way that you bring forth the ever man. And this simply means to live in such a way that your life is aimed at bringing forth something greater than you are. It means to live your life in longing for something beyond your current horizons. And it means being willing to make sacrifices, which Nietzsche emphasizes a lot to spend yourself and your life and spend your vitality. And in this, the overman is the promise of the redemption of mankind from all its faults. It's a, uh, dare I say it, faith in the ascendance of life, winning out over the degeneration of life. It's faith in the positive feedback loop of life. Um, and so can we say in general terms what that good life looks like? I mean, well, we see it in Zarathustra's prologue and the tightrope walker, the jester. I mean, the, the literal word translation means rope dancer. Um, there, it's roughly equivalent to what we would mean by a tightrope walker, but you have the word dancer there in, in German. And so, uh, you know, that's very important because in Nietzsche, dancing is such a metaphor for, you know, the expression of the deepest happiness of the, you know, anyway, uh, so the rope dancer, the sort of clownish character, this jester lives his life in practice of a dangerous craft and he dies while performing his craft. And, um, Zarathustra, you know, 
uh, praises him in, in some sense. It's Nietzsche's exaltation to us to live dangerously. Build your temples on the slopes of Mount Vesuvius. So fully commit to your great passions in life and be honest about what it is that drives you, which is something that may take you years to explore and come to any understanding of. And many great and dangerous experiments <laughs> to see uh, what happens when you let certain drives take the wheel, so to speak. Um, so let's look at some examples of good lives, which I think might be instructive. Um, Nietzsche would suggest we look to, if we want an example of the good life in the Nietzschean sense, we should look to uh, figures such as Goethe, a true Renaissance man. I mean, he wrote beautifully in every style of literature, expanded the possibilities for the German language, um, had this vast catalog of poems. And Goethe stands as a soul torn between classical aesthetics and the fiery passion of romanticism. Or we could consider a non-artist, uh, a completely non-theoretical man, a man praised by the aforementioned Goethe, in fact, as much as by Hegel and many of the intellectuals of his time, Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon emerges from the chaos and the excess of the French Revolution in order to produce a new French empire, and in the process he constructs the modern French state, and he is by the numbers the most effective military commander of all time. Uh, to this very day, and by a mile. Um, and so just as Goethe reshaped the German artistic landscape in his own image, Napoleon reshaped the French political landscape in his own image. These were men who dared to command, to follow the dictates of their will, and impose their judgments. And that was a risk, a hazard. As Napoleon says, when fortune is done with him, quote, she will break me like a glass, end quote. But, you know, most won't measure up to these examples. Many will fail. Some, like Caesar, will succeed, but in their moment of triumph, when their victory is barely drawn a breath, they meet their downfall. But in the image of such people, whether we find it attainable or not, we may find the inspiration to attempt to emulate the good life. In Twilight of Idols, the section Skirmishes of an Untimely Man Number 48, we find this passage which uh, references Napoleon and speaks of him in the language of being this ideal for what ascending life looks like. Nietzsche makes reference to the idea of a return to nature, and I think there he's primarily rebutting the Rousseauian ideals concerning what such a thing would entail. Uh, quote, Progress in my sense. I too speak of a return to nature, although it is really not a going back, but a going up, an ascent to the high, free, even terrible nature and naturalness, where great tasks are something one plays with, one may play with. To put it metaphorically, Napoleon was a piece of return to nature, as I understand the phrase. For example, in Rebus Tacticis even more, as military men know, in matters of strategy, end quote. So he references there Napoleon's um, extraordinary record as a tactician and the fact that he was a very, um, he was a man who acted, it seemed, on, on instinct, right? Uh, and so Nietzsche often speaks of great and terrible individuals, right? And there are many ways in which we could take that description. But at bottom, I think the important thing, he's getting at the essentially innocent nature of all of our drives. Innocent because they're natural. Innocent in the way that it's innocent when a hawk eats a little field mouse, right? The high, free, terrible naturalness he speaks of is a human being who has recaptured this sense of innocence and thus is free to follow the commands of his own will because he's freed from imposing guilt or imposing moral condemnation upon those drives. And so, yes, such a person might end up doing what we would call evil things. But that's by no means the focus of what Nietzsche is talking about here. Um, you know, not, Napoleon's not great because of like a body count, right? 
that would be uh, rather morbid. Um, the point of living the good life is not to do evil things. I mean, it's the moralists will try and scare us by making us, uh, you know, think that that's what any sort of belief in life in the world outside of a transcendent or divine telos, that's what that means. But Nietzsche... Nietzsche is just simply demanding of himself that he be honest with us here and admit that a return to innocent human nature, in fact, means getting in touch with a part of ourselves which is passionate, domineering, and at times violent and unreasonable. Uh, in the very next section of Twilight of Idols, Nietzsche gives us his assessment of Goethe. This is section 49, quote, Goethe not a German event, but a European one. A magnificent attempt to overcome the 18th century by a return to nature, by an ascent to the naturalness of the Renaissance. A kind of self-overcoming on the part of that century. He bore its strongest instincts within himself. The sensibility, the idolatry of nature, the anti-historic, the idealistic, the unreal and revolutionary the latter merely being a form of the unreal. He sought help from history, natural science, antiquity, and also Spinoza, but above all, from practical activity. He surrounded himself with limited horizons. He did not retire from life, but put himself into the midst of it. He was not faint-hearted, but took as much as possible upon himself, over himself, into himself. What he wanted was totality, he fought the mutual extraneousness of reason, senses, feeling, and will, preached with the most abhorrent scholasticism by Kant, the antipode of Goethe. He disciplined himself to wholeness. He created himself. In the middle of an age with an unreal outlook, Goethe was a convinced realist. He said yes to everything that was related to him in this respect, and he had no greater experience than that ends realissimum most real being, called Napoleon. Goethe conceived a human being who would be strong, highly educated, skillful in all bodily matters, self-controlled, reverent toward himself, and who might dare to afford the whole range and wealth of being natural, being strong enough for such freedom. The man of tolerance, not from weakness, but from strength, because he knows how to use his, to his advantage even that from which the average nature would perish. The man for whom there is no longer anything that is forbidden, unless it be weakness, whether called vice or virtue. Such a spirit who has become free stands amid the cosmos with a joyous and trusting fatalism, in the fate that only the particular is loathsome, and that all is redeemed and affirmed in the whole. He does not negate any more. Such a faith, however, is the highest of all possible faiths. I have baptized it with the name of Dionysus, end quote. And so, <clears throat> very clear terms, Nietzsche calls Goethe Dionysian, but in a very specific meaning of the Dionysian, which we've talked about. Uh, and so in comparing and contrasting, you know, the profiles of Napoleon and Goethe, surely both are candidates for what Nietzsche would call the good life, and we have a more or less adequate picture of what it entails. Naturalness, straightforwardness, and a trusting fatalism. Um, and, of course, you know, the fact that both create something great beyond themselves, which is an imposition of their creative will on reality. Uh, but the fatalism aspect, you know, in other places, Nietzsche criti criticized, um, excuse me, uh, criticized a fatalistic attitude in the sense of being oppressed or like a bound fatalism, what he disparagingly calls Mohammedan fatalism. But this trusting fatalism that he describes is different. It's trusting in life, trusting in necessity, um, feeling that everything is redeemed in the whole, right? Um, that in the whole picture, um, life is more beautiful than it is ugly, we might say. And, um, you know, in the full awareness of the danger Napoleon brought upon himself, but you know, without a care for it, he pursues this ambitious course in life. That's a perfect example of trusting fatalism. Um, and the fruits of such an 
natural, healthy life are freedom, gratitude, a sense of cheerfulness. But notice it's not, uh, when we're talking about a life that's free and natural, remember when Nietzsche describes Goethe as a return to nature, he's already said what that means and that there's this inherently, uh, it's like his conception of what that means is a, a nature that is inherently sort of uh, violent and dangerous. But those who most profoundly mantle that role in life become something that's almost more than human, more like a cataclysmic event, a shockwave that rocks an entire continent, a force that reshapes an entire culture, launches an entire artistic movement. And so in this context, uh, perhaps we might look at the third question, what, what facilitates the good life? This is, in effect, a, a question of Nietzschean virtues, and again, while we may consider these examples, uh, we must understand that the passages that I'm going to read in this respect don't refer to any absolute claim of morality or universal application for all the reasons we've already talked about. Um, you know, everyone has their own way, their own vol virtues to cultivate and so on. Nietzsche says that your most precious virtues will be known to you alone and you will not even have a name for them, right? Because the most personal things the things which can't be shared by the universal word concepts that we communicate with via language. Um, but Nietzsche nevertheless offers us a few uh, suggestions about the cultivation of a good life. And so there are a few reliable pieces of wisdom he has for those of us who wish to live a healthy life. Uh, this is in Beyond Good and Evil 284. I'll quote here in an abridged form. Quote, to live with tremendous and proud composure, always beyond, to have and not to have one's effects, one's pro and con, at will, to condescend to them for a few hours, to seat oneself on them as a horse, often as on an ass. For one must know how to make use of their stupidity as much as of their fire, and to choose for company that impish and cheerful vice, courtesy and to remain master of one's four virtues, of courage, insight, sympathy, and solitude. For solitude is a virtue for us, as a sublime bent and urge for cleanliness, which guesses how all contact between man and man in society involves inevitable uncleanliness. All community makes men, somehow, somewhere, sometime, common." End quote. So, four virtues here. First, courage. This is required for the good life because courage is required for any command decision, right? An act of will, we might say. Um, it, because as we said, daring to act in one's own will, on one's own judgments, is dangerous. Then we have insight, which means not acting based on superficial qualities or surface-level observations. That would just see you misled and would be counterproductive. Um, these virtues are very uh, virtu virtuistic in the old sense of the word, right? In terms of efficiency. Sympathy is an odd one for Nietzsche, one might think, especially because he follows it up with solitude, which he justifies by saying that all participation in society makes us unclean. And he means, I think, uh, intellectually, morally, emotionally unclean, right? We're getting... Uh, communicated all these uh, sort of sick herd values into our heads when we're in society. Um, but this reveals, I think, that we have two sort of couplets within the four, which are sort of counterbalancing. You know, you, you need to be courageous, which means suspending judgment and acting, uh, or like suspending deliberation and acting. That's a better way to, to put it. And yet one also needs insight, which means not acting blindly, or based on short-term interests that are in the long-term sense unhealthy, right? So sort of a counterbalance to the capacity for action that you need in courage. Uh, insight is the capacity for reflection in some sense. And then, uh, you know, we also need a sense of sympathy, a sincere, heartfelt, emotional connection to other human beings. That's natural uh, for human beings as much as anything else we've been talking about. Um, it's natural between members of a family or with people we love. And it, it's required that we, that it exists to some extent in order to function in society. 
it's the basis of all things like, you know, courtesy and respect and charity, many of these socially beneficial behaviors and attitudes that are required for civilization as a project to continue. And yet if we truly want greatness in our lives, solitude is required. One has to be able to leave the endless, all-pervasive influence of the thoughts of others. This chorus of judge, judging voices all around us that render our own individual judgments moot uh, or our experimental judgments forbidden, right? Declare them uh, immoral, harmful, dangerous. And so the judgmental voice of the majority exists with us at all times in the form of conscience. And it's more strongly felt the more often we're exposed to the judgments of others. And that makes us all common, as he says, somehow, some way. It imparts some of the same thoughts or the same types of thoughts. And so for someone to live the good life and to bring forth something greater, something stronger, something healthier, they have to be able to move outside of the current cultural moral software. One has to cultivate the ability to think their own thoughts because that's the only way to go beyond the current values, which that's the possibility of the great individual who reshapes said values, creates new things. Uh, Nietzsche has another set of four virtues in a different place in the book uh, Daybreak or the Dawn. This is section 556. It's similar, but it's not exactly the same uh, list of virtues but we can see a similar reasoning here. So this is a different list as it appears. Quote, The good four, honest with ourselves and whoever else is our friend, courageous with the enemy, magnanimous with the vanquished, and courteous always. Thus the four cardinal virtues want us. End quote. So courage is included in both. Um, out of these two lists of four, the total seven cardinal Nietzschean virtues would be uh, courage, insight, sympathy, solitude, courtesy, magnanimity, and honesty. And I hope everyone can hear when I say the phrase card cardinal Nietzschean virtues that my tongue is in my cheek here. Nevertheless, that's as good a list of virtues as any religion's ever produced, and maybe better than any religion has produced in far insofar as uh, <clears throat> we have solitude as a virtue it's a masterful idea and a unique contribution of nietzsche uh, kaufman put points out in a footnote to the good four passage that plato also has four cardinal virtues which are wisdom courage temperance and justice um so that's interesting courage appears in both of nietzsche's lists and in plato's uh, and there's some additional overlap in that, you know, wisdom and insight probably could be roughly considered analogous. Um, temperance, kind of similar to magnanimity to some degree. But it's interesting the way in which they contradict one another. Because justice is absent from Nietzsche's list. And in fact, something like justice would generally be considered a vice for Nietzsche. Zarathustra says in the passage on the tarantulas that, if, you know... <laughs> For the culture warrior who's totally concerned with justice, the thing that actually stands behind that word is the desire for revenge. Zarathustra says the bridge to his highest hope for humanity and a rainbow after long storms is that mankind shall be delivered from revenge. As if he's redeeming man from a sin, we might say, to belabor the point, right? So look to the cheerful, trusting fatalism that Nietzsche mentioned earlier in describing Goethe and which could also be applied to Napoleon. Why such a fatalistic embrace of necessity? Because in this world as will to power, we find nothing of guilt or moral responsibility. And so if we're dutiful to the virtue of insight, we consider our, in our feelings and actions involving others that everyone we encounter is entirely innocent of any wrongdoing. All we encounter are simply manifestations of the will to power, pushing and pulling against us, or attracting and repulsing us. And the person who does you harm is no more immoral than when a hurricane does you harm, or when a mad dog bites you, or when you, you, know, when you open the cabinet and a jar of something falls and hits you on the head. You don't factor morality into those things. You might still get angry. You might be physically harmed or even emotionally uh, you know, aggrieved by it. But when all is said and done, 
the virtuous person maintains a degree of equanimity with the knowledge that all that's happened is absolutely necessary and would happen the same way every time. That's, I mean, to put it in another way, it's a means of maintaining a sort of uh, mental or emotional cleanliness. Because the most dangerous thing for the spirit, the most corrupting influence possible is the influence of resentment. That's the feeling one gets when one wishes to take revenge, to pay back harm that one that one has experienced, right? But you cannot do so, right? That's when resentment arises, is when you want to respond, repay someone kind, but you don't have the power. Uh, this is driven by will to power as much as anything else, but this is a negative feedback loop type of pattern. Because this feeling it turns one's will in a counterproductive direction. It's <clears throat> corrosive to the soul. The individual suffers greatly for, from it. And resentment's not aimed at creating anything or at bringing anything forth. It's solely aimed at destroying. It's externally directed and it's negative in its orientation. And so a life lived in service to resentment is very useful in providing one of many counterexamples for us to what the good life might be. And, or a counterexample of how to facilitate the good life. The good life is the opposite of a resentful life. Now, just to clear, or a caveat when we're talking about justice, there's another kind of justice, which Nietzsche argues in Human All Too Human, originated amongst the noble classes of society. The warrior aristocracies of old would strike agreements with one another based on the perception of relatively equal strength between two parties. That's how they established the concept of rights, of a certain respect or, or a certain things due to all parties. The basis of justice in such a perspective, it's, the rea it's based on the reality that if there were a conflict between the parties, mutual injury or death might occur. And so all parties must be treated fairly. Their rights must be respected, but it's out of that fundamental power balance. Furthermore, if one amongst these parties is slighted, one re does actually possess the ability to repay the slight. And if one is given a gift, one incurs an obligation to repay that gift because um, you know, it would be expected that you also would have that ability. It's the whole gift-giving culture among the nobility that we see uh, across the world, particularly in China, for example. The same happens if... For example, somebody of this type of noble mindset is shown mercy. Out of goodwill, mutual goodwill, they ought to return the favor with leniency in the future, right? This is the justice of the warrior aristocrats of antiquity, balancing the scales between multiple parties who respect one another's rights out of a mutual respect for each other's power. And so... When when we contrast justice and the way Plato's talking about it uh, <clears throat> against Nietzsche's virtues, justice is not a Nietzschean virtue because what justice has come to mean has become so foreign from that original concept of justice that what it now signifies is almost entirely synonymous with the revenge seeking of aggrieved people. Um, in fact, justice as a virtue to Nietzsche, if he were to include that, it would resemble something more like the willingness to back up your words with your deeds and the power to rebalance the scales when they're unbalanced. Um, fairness in a mutual agreement among equals. And thus we see a healthy justice portrayed as the product of an aristocracy and an unhealthy justice portrayed as the product of the weak. And that this is a key to decoding many of the puzzles of Nietzschean virtue ethics, if we might call it that, that it's not power that corrupts, but weakness. That it's the weak person lacking in power who will use any means to get it, who will become resentful and destructive. One, therefore, should distrust the weak and should also avoid allowing oneself to become weak at all costs. If for no other reason that a weak person's fate is to be corrupted by resentment as they constantly find themselves imposed upon the power of others, but unable to assert themselves, or to retaliate, or to make their power felt. 
accepting the essential inequality of life, the injustice of life, which is all implied by what we've been talking about, accepting all of these uncomfortable realities is perhaps what we might call another virtue of Nietzsche's that he didn't explicitly list, perhaps what we could call hardness. It's in one of Zarathustra's parables that we get the simple maxim, become hard. Um, And this means become tough. And it does mean physically, but also psychologically, intellectually. Um, I mean, that this would include the ability to entertain painful, dangerous, or uncomfortable ideas. And perhaps the most uncomfortable for us now, uh, looking at all this, would be the inevitable difference between human beings and the implications of ascending and descending life for society. Um, the implications of the nature of life as contained in commanding and obeying. Um, that all human life has involved what we would call, according to our moral system today, immorality and exploitation. And that if you're prospering and flourishing today, your success is built on the same kind of exploitation. The kind of toughness we're talking about involves cutting off those false paths of mentation, which allow you to deal with that brute reality in a dishonest way, such as by imposing moral guilt upon yourself or upon all society, or by becoming resentful or by entertaining utopian ideals that violate human nature. These are no longer open to us in this conception of Nietzschean virtue. For obvious reasons, affirming life in this way is not possible for everyone, as we've said, and so Nietzsche's ultimate challenge is accepting life to the point of asking for the same life to recur eternally. That's said in Nietzsche's unpublished notes to be a challenge that will enliven the strong, but break and paralyze the world weary. It's not a universal life philosophy, and the good life can't be reached by everyone. Although all things considered, it's not a particularly shocking claim about the good life now, is it? I mean, going all the way back to the Greek philosophers who gave us the concept there's always been the fair warning that virtue is not the province of all people. Quite the opposite, in fact. I mean, in some deep way, if virtue was possessed by all people, it would cease to become virtue. Uh, Virtue is, at bottom, a quality. It's a power, an aspect, an ability that someone or something has. And like all things, it's physiological in the most fundamental sense. And therefore, not everyone can possess the same ones, Uh, And human beings differ so much in their inclinations. And even within the range of possibilities that you might possess, there's no guarantee for Nietzsche that any course of action or set of intentions will bring you to the good life. It's just not the property of the common person. But in his affirmative philosophy, we see how he even affirms the the act of uh, aspiring to it, right? Uh, Of of playing the dice game for death and taking the risk for it, even in full knowledge that you probably won't attain it. That, And in this way, he brings his meta answer to the question in line with his own aesthetic um, attempt to justify life that he's always sort of, that perspective he's always been coming from of see the beauty in the tragedy, right? And so it's a... Self-overcoming starts with that feeling he talks about in Zarathustra of a great contempt, great dissatisfaction with oneself, and the willingness to endure real dangers and real suffering, um, because that's what's needed to get out of wretched self-complacency. And just like the dancer on the tightrope, this in itself is laudable for Nietzsche, even if you fall off the rope. And so let's talk about falling off the rope. The final question I raised, uh, the final aspect we broke the question of the meaning of life into was the question of how we confront death. And Nietzsche gives us a pretty straightforward answer in Beyond Good and Evil 96. Quote, One should part from life as Odysseus parted from Nausicaa, blessing it rather than in love with it. End quote. Now, uh, some have suggested that Odysseus may actually have been in love with Nausicaa, even if 
this was unrequited love. I mean, Nausicaa is a beautiful young woman Odysseus meets on his travels while shipwrecked, and she's so beautiful that Odysseus compares her to a goddess. And, uh, you know, they, the two of them seem to have feelings for one another, but when the time comes for Odysseus to depart, he leaves her out of necessity, right? And so that's what Nietzsche is talking about. I mean, he presents his ideal attitude is of celebrating and being grateful, being grateful for having been graced with that encounter by beauty, right? But not becoming despondent and melancholic by having to part from this experience, but doing so uh, voluntarily um, and with uh, you know ease. And so this expresses an attitude that is totally commensurate with people who, in some ways, their attitude is an antipode of Nietzsche, but we might consider the Taoism of Lao Tzu or Zhuangzi. The image of the figure who loves life but does not cling to life because true love of life involves a knowledge of life's transformative and impermanent nature. And so the sage in his wisdom in Taoism doesn't cling to any particular forms or manifestations of life. Nietzsche puts this in perhaps a stronger way in which he brings out a dichotomy between two ways that we could think about death. One way or really ways we could think about mortality, right? So one way in which death is viewed in an unhealthy manner, and then he talks about another way in which we regard death in a healthy or life-ascending manner. Quote, The certain prospect of death could sweeten every life with a precious and fragrant drop of levity. And now you strange apothecary souls have turned it into an ill-tasting drop of poison that makes the whole of life repulsive, end quote. So the inevitability of death that we perceive in our mortality could either hang over our heads at all hours like the sword of Damocles, letting this thought intrude on us at all times, and therefore look, ruin all the happiness and joy and fulfillment we might be able to have, or... We may, why can't we see it in more lighthearted terms as a natural um, something which we take in good humor, which allows us to keep our life in perspective and all the events of life in perspective, um, to see the comedy of the misplaced importance we have and like the trivia trivium of our lives, right? Um, you could see death as the end to the play that reveals our life's meaning to us. That might be like another way we could look at it, right? Um, the insight that a perpetual existence uh, would actually be rather torturous. That could be another um, <laughs> like way we could look at it. That some limit to life, some framing, some finitude creates the horizons within which we can actually have a distinct, different, individual ex existence. And that it's like through these limitations that we have a narrative making our subjective experience possible. This is all found within finitude. And um, I mean, however we want to look at it, once we accept that life really needs to have some finitude, at that point, is life long? Is life short? I mean, who can say? It has to end sometime. Life can't last forever in order for it to be life. So let's let the inevitable end serve as that motivation to sweeten every moment let it be a drop of honey on everything right there was a, a, a sorry to go eastern again but i just thought of this there's a zen master who wrote a poem i'll give sort of the uh, the paraphrasing translation from zen flesh zen bones uh, it's like uh quote this day will never come again each moment is like a precious gem end quote the attitude given in this poem it, it's the kind of attitude that colors our whole life and the whole of our ex experience when we reflect on the finitude of life with this Nietzschean uh, outlook. And he's simply saying, um, you know, uh, maybe this is one way in which we should call to mind the contingency of all interpretations and just consider that the uh, dreary and pessimistic view of uh life and its finitude is not by any means the obvious default perspective and that 
th- we have examples of people like Odysseus or the Taoist sages, as I just brought up, who people who are able to bless life without, um, without clinging to it. Right. And that perhaps the, and for someone like myself, the knowledge of death and the finitude of life is a very motivating thing. We're going to look at a final Nietzsche quote today, and it provides the best and I think most innovative response to the troubling awareness of our own mortality, and that is, don't think about it. It's funny because, you know, the philosophical types, we always think we have to have some sort of answer to everything, right? A philosophical position on every issue. And mortality, you know, our own death, it's one of those things that the intellect can't answer. You can't think your way out of death. It comes to everyone, and no one knows what happens. And even if we accept the materialist account, that consciousness simply ends. We can't conceive of non-being. It's beyond our experience, no matter what it is, and it must remain beyond our experience. And we, so we just cannot comprehend it, and it's coming to everyone. And so naturally, you can become very fixated on this and disturbed by it, and like come to believe that before you face that moment, the moment of death or the dissolution of consciousness or passing on to the other world or whatever you might think happens, that they have to, you know, quote unquote, figure it all out first, right? We have to do something before we meet death to be ready for it. That'll make a difference whether we've made our peace with it or not. But in reality, I think we all know deep down that it doesn't really matter what level of intellectual progress we've made in grappling with or understanding death um, because you, you're not going to get there. Um, you're not going to understand it because it's beyond you and it's going to come when it comes. And there's no guarantee you'll get your time to work it all out before it does. I mean, we don't have the the privilege of um, uh, Jorge Luis Borges, uh, his character in the story, the, uh, the, the secret miracle. He's a, um, a playwright who's about to be shot and he begs God for the time to finish his play. And time freezes and the playwright's able to mentally think out everything. And, um, you know, like he finishes his whole play. He finishes all his great, his magnum opus in the moment before the bullet hits his brain. A moment that lasts, he allows it to last for like like hundreds of years, if I recall correctly. So, um, you know, unless you find yourself in the twilight zone or in a magical realist short story, that isn't usually how it all works. So this is one of my favorite um, Nietzsche passages. He argues against our philosophical inclinations. And uh, as elitist as Nietzsche can be, and we've discussed a lot of that in this episode, he has his moments where he can take a step back to admire or pay his respect to the average person. And in this aphorism, Nietzsche, from my read of it, seems to be people watching. I I get that impression that that's what he's doing when he had the idea for the aphorism. And, um... This is from the Gay Science Book 4, section 278. Quote, The thought of death, living in the midst of this jumble of little lanes, needs, and voices, gives me a melancholy happiness. How much enjoyment, impatience, and desire, how much thirsty life and drunkenness of life comes to light every moment. And yet silence will soon descend on all these noisy, living, life-thirsty people. How his shadow stands even now behind everyone, as his dark fellow traveler. It is always like the last moment before the departure of an immigrant's ship. People have more to say to each other than ever. The hour is late, and the ocean and its desolate silence are waiting impatiently behind all of this noise. So covetous and certain of their prey and all and every one of them suppose that heretofore was little or nothing while the near future is everything, and that is the reason for all of this haste, this clamor, this outshouting and overreaching each other. Everyone wants to be the first in this future, and yet death and deathly silence alone are certain and common to all in this future. How strange it is that this sole certainty and common element makes almost no impression on people, and that nothing is further from their minds than the feeling that they form a brotherhood of death. It makes me happy that men do not want at all to think the thought of death. I should like very much to do something, 
that would make the thought of life even a hundred times more appealing to them. End quote. So as a final word, um, my personal advice to agree with Nietzsche is don't spoil your high moments thinking about the end. This ties in, into uh, Nietzsche's critique of pity, which we've only briefly touched on here, but about how fixating on cruelty happening elsewhere, suffering happening to other people, it only serves to um, infect us with that suffering. We've been enculturated to think that what goes up must come down, to always keep in mind that we'll be laid low and into dust one day. And because of this, it, that feeds right into the feeling that we feel we still have to worry about having the correct thing in our hearts by the time we face death. And the extent to which we have that feeling still is the extent to which we are still Christian. The thought of death is a heavy, weighty thought. It might be important to pick up that weight and lift it from time to time, especially for the Hyperboreans out there. But we can't let it become a heavy weight, a, a burden, right? And so to the extent that the common man is, relatively speaking, freed from the heavy existential concerns that plague philosophers, Nietzsche says he's better off for it. And we should never forget that our concern with such things is a handicap, something deleterious to life. The meaning of life is not found by saddling ourselves with burdens or by making things grave and serious. The thought of death is useful so long as it can enrich our lives, sweeten our lives, make us appreciate that our moments are precious gems. But while we are living those moments, the point is to become absorbed and engaged in the here and now, to live in such a way that you fall in love with life, and ideally a kind of mature love, like that of Lao Tzu or Odysseus. Or better yet, that you live with such vigor and zeal that you leave behind a stamp upon the world, like Goethe or Napoleon, to live with the kind of creative, innocent sincerity described by Nietzsche in the most cheerful and most elevated moments in his work, to live in such a way that when you come to the end of your life, you know that you would gladly do it all over again. The attitude that we should have when facing death is, as Nietzsche describes, quoting from the Greeks, someone who says, was that life? Well then, once more. If you enjoyed the Nietzsche podcast or found it helpful, you can visit us and support the show at patreon.com slash untimely reflections. The link is in the description. Or just share the show with any of your friends that you think might enjoy it or on social media. Thank you for your support.